Thanks. I'm Pat McKernan from Volunteers of America, and Angela said I'm also the president of the Coalition of Community Corrections Providers. I want to thank Ralph Fretz and everyone from CEC for coming back this morning or today. Uh, <laughs> we stand as a proud partner, though, Volunteers of America, as well as the coalition with CEC and the work that you're doing. And so I want to thank you for the research that you've presented. I am going to talk a little bit more specifically about gender responsive approaches um, on a couple of the programs that I run or am privileged to run uh, in the city of Camden. I'm not sure where I am with my slides, so I should look at them. Um, so who is Volunteers of America? I've actually talked with a number of you, and a lot of you, because we're in Newark today, a lot of people know Volunteers of America Greater New York. But there are actually 38 affiliates all over the country. Volunteers of America, I am the affiliate that serves the southern part of the state, so the Delaware Valley. Our programs are located in New, uh, Camden, New Jersey, all of our reentry programs. Um, our mission statement, though, <coughs> excuse me, is to provide evidence-based interventions to offenders in an effort to promote, their, uh, promote public safety and reduce their risk of reoffending. So this conference for us is appropriate. This is how those of us who are working in community corrections have been living for the last 15 years, and if they haven't, they're probably not around any longer to, to be here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It's important for us to look at models, not only how we run particular programs, and I think that was a little bit of the differentiation yesterday about a particular intervention or a program specific for a particular need, and then an approach, pardon me, an approach of a program. So we're going to talk a little bit about both of those. Um, so Volunteers America, we run a number of community corrections programs, and I'm not going to cover all of them, but we run uh, both residential and non-residential programming. Garrett House is our women's facility in Camden. It's a 47-bed women's facility, so it's nice to see Andrea Cantora from John Jay, who has done some research with us as well. Hello. Um, and then the FORGE program, which Angela's already covered, so I'm, I'm probably, I'm not going to talk as much about FORGE. But when you look at, and Ralph threw out the term RCRP, which is a residential community release program, those of us who are following evidence-based practices should be accomplishing the following. We typically, community providers, have to address risk and need. And the manner in which we do that is through some of these, some of these ways, about em employment and educational preparedness, provision of evidence-based interventions. And I want to talk about what some of the ones that we run specifically for women. Uh, addressing relapse prevention skills, family reunification, budgeting and financial management skills, ad assistance with identification documents. Um, it, promoting accountability of both clients and, and, and their uh, whereabouts in the community and preparing for with discharge planning. So Garrett House, we opened in 2004. Um, I had uh, previously served men in that facility, so we had a longstanding um, uh, history of serving a, this small, in community correction size, 47 beds is a very small program. Um, it is a much different experience serving women uh, in a residential setting. So who are these women at Garrett House? Uh, their average age is 36. Their average ed educational attainment, because I know there's researchers in the room who actually like numbers, so I'll cover these quickly. Um, uh, nearly 12th grade. Uh, the number of arrests is, th prior arrests is 13. And I think that for those of you who work with folks, I think it's important to remember, we see, for us, and this is my anecdotal evidence, a significant difference between the priors, the amount of priors that the women have con uh, compared to their male cohort. And literally, for Volunteers of America, we have a Garrett House on one block, and a block away, we have a men's facility, an 84-bed men's facility. So we have staff looking at them saying, I'm seeing women with 20, 25, 30 arrests, prior arrests before this conviction compared to a male cohort with much fewer. Their average length of sentence was 53 months. 14% <clears throat> of, of the uh, 63 Garrett House women uh, in the sample were convicted of violent, of violent offenses. Um, there was some research done, so I was kind of asking them to pull some of that data and combine it. 38% of them were for drugs, and 37 were for property crimes. Um, the average LSIR score was 28. For those of you who aren't familiar with LSIR but were here yesterday, um, that's the moderate range. So we're seeing that's we are not talking about low-risk offenders. We spent a lot of yesterday talking about not providing intensive services to low-risk people. So it's, we're not doing that. And Ralph can attest to that as well. Um, and then racially, the, our women t look very much like the, the prison population in New Jersey. 64% were African American, 13% were Hispanic, and 22% were Caucasian. Actually, that's a little bit inverted for Caucasian and Hispanic compared to our uh, New Jersey prison population. Oops. Okay. Did I go backwards? No, I didn't. Okay. So Garrett House, 47-bed facility. I've already talked about we serve women. We serve women coming out of the state prison. So the majority of the folks that are there are coming from the New, Jer New Jersey Department of Corrections. I'm not sure if I see anybody here. I saw some folks yesterday from the Department of Corrections. I don't. Okay. All right. From our chaplaincy. Um, but we work with the community programs <clears throat> to send women to this program. We also served for a period of time uh, women who were on parole 
who were referred directly from the parole board or who were referred through our promise program or district office referrals for women who were on parole and who weren't making it and needed to go back into residential care. So that's what pre-release and parole status means. This is so small, I can't even read it. So hold up. <laughs> Apparently this is like an eye exam trying to just keep moving it closer to me. We don't serve sex offenders or arsonists in any community release program. Um, and uh, on the right-hand side, I sort of enumerated some of the things that we do cover. The, those of us who run community corrections program, very typical to cover job readiness. How do you get a job? How do you fill, an how, how do you fill out an application? How do you address your criminal history on an, uh, on an interview? Um, everyone is assigned a case manager. That ca case manager can be doing everything from running the groups, the, the CBT groups that I'm going to talk about, to contacting your DIFUS worker about arranging visitation with your kids, helping you with your budgeting, um, uh, arranging for furloughs if you're eligible to do that. So that case manager is a critical part of how services are delivered. Um, I want to save talking about CBT for a minute. Um, family inclusion, we involve family members uh, in the transition home for folks. People come up for family night, people come up for visits, clients go home, the family members are a part of the intake process and, through, and, we, and that's part of our, our uh, not only our phase system but our quality assurance uh, measures is involving families at every opportunity. Everything do in Garrett House is run on a phase system. So when you first come into the program, you have to earn privileges out. That speaks to yesterday's evidence-based practice of how do you reward behavior. So you have to really create incentives within a residential setting, as well as non-residential setting. But when you're running a program, creating incentives so that people, there's motivation to do the right thing. I already talked about promise. How am I on time? Good, you didn't check. You're you don't know when I started, so I'm really good on time. You're, you're out of time. <laughs> yeah. well, I'm going to keep talking. Um, so what are evidence-based uh, interventions run at Garrett? Um, obviously, I think you've spent some time today talking about risk assessments. All things start with risk assessment. Your risk assessment has to drive your treatment plan. One size does not fit all, and it has to be individualized for the women that you're, for anybody that you're serving, but especially for the women that you're serving. Motivational interviewing is a technique, and I, I always think it's funny for those of you who are not in the field who think, oh, I, I do motivational interviewing all the time. It's not about you can do it. <laughs> I believe in you. That's, that's not motivational interviewing. That's nice. Um, but motivational interviewing is actually a, a, a technique that counselors um, use to overcome barriers, overcome uh, resistance, and to help people move in stages of change toward a more action-oriented stage of change so that they're more ready. It would be great if every client who came into our program said, I am so ready to just implement everything you're telling me to do, and I am so ready to change every behavior, and I don't want to go back to prison, and I don't want to go back to using drugs. And even if the motivation is there, they really don't have the skills. I think Ed Latesse's picture with, with his daughter on the, uh, on the screen about not knowing, not having the skills that you need, even if the motivation is there to change behavior. So motivational interviewing is critical. It's a, it's a part of the process when you're assessing as well as, as uh, working with people uh, throughout their stay. Um, I talked about individualized treatment plans driven by the risk assessment and cognitive behavioral interventions that focus on skill development. I apologize for missing this morning, so I don't know if any detail was given about what is cognitive behavioral interventions. Okay. So what we mean by that in the most simplest form is that you have to address the way people think to have an effect on their behavior. It's one thing a lot of our clients perceive risks and threats and what have you and, and in, in a way that in, it, it does not promote them to solve problems effectively. So we've got to get people to change their perception of events so that they can put the, the right kinds of problem-solving skills into place and to have a different result. Um, so trauma-informed care, this is also something that we recognized rather early on when we opened Garrett House, that if you were going to be addressing the, needs, the treatment needs of women, that you have to do something about trauma. And I'm sure that that was covered earlier, and it was covered a bit yesterday. And I'll, ta I'll talk about the intervention that we use, but also focusing on relapse prevention. What can people say, think, or do differently so that they don't go back to the same behaviors? So in reference to the eye test, Felt like I'm like I'm going from the larger print, smaller and smaller, and see who's really paying attention. So this is where I'll speak really quickly because no one probably can read this. There's really two types, of, two model programs, two um, cognitive behavioral interventions that we run specifically at Garrett. There are others, but these are probably I think the most 
uh, that would be referred to as gender responsive. Moving on, which actually was in the commissioner's um, uh, presentation yesterday, was one listed as one of the, I, I take it with us, I'm not sure who else is running Moving On right now, but Moving On is a program that was specifically developed for women. It's a cognitive behavioral intervention program, 26 sessions run by a female facilitator addressing the issues of motivation and problem solving and alternatives and consequential thinking, um, you know, coping, self-talk, all of those kinds of uh, assertiveness training and, and building your motivation to change. Uh, as it relates to trauma-informed care, we adopted Seeking Safety. This was a model that it was actually recommended to me from drug court, and it is a, a, a model that we found also referenced in other SAMHSA literature. But it is another cognitive behavioral intervention addressing trauma. So looking at risky situations, it is a, it's a 20-session program uh, addressed again by a female facilitator with the women and addressing problems as it relates to trauma. Being aware of, I'm trying to think what this, since I can't really read the, very, very small print here, but essentially what we're doing in seeking safety is problem solving as well as um, the cognitive behavioral interventions related to trauma and how you perceive problems. So um, I'm probably repeating myself, so I'm rushing because I'm Ralph is, I know, exactly. So what are the outcomes? Let's get to the outcomes. As it relates to evidence-based, Angela talked a little bit about that in the, in the numbers of folks uh, not going back to prison. But I think one of the other things we need to take account for in New Jersey is that there has been a proliferation of female-specific uh, programs. Um, Garrett House opened in 2004. The Forge program really under, under shepherded under uh, Angela's leadership, uh, as well as Columbus House, who is a, it's a specific program run by Kintock that serves both men and women, but women with uh, mental health issues. SRPW uh, uh, is a program run by NJAC specifically for women, and Promise also serves women as well, recognizing that to me, and we've saw this consistently since we've opened the doors, that there is an, a significant over-representation of mental health needs with the women that we serve. The good news is that women are succeeding in these programs. Um, I collect every year uh, who, who, how, many people how many people complete my programs. Now granted, this is not compared to a larger cohort or a non-matched sample, whatever, but this is just me counting how many people can finish. And that's important because my clients and my staff want to know. Every year since I have opened the program, Garrett House women, with all of their multitude of needs and the lengthy criminal history, outperform the men every year. Every year, and they know it because I tell them. <laughs> but I look—I actually went back and looked at the last six years of data, and it's in—and it's—it's. I think it's significant. On average, 75% of the women who come into Garrett House complete, and compared to their male cohort, the males—the men who come to my Fletcher House facility and our Hope Hall facility—only 61% of those men. And that's still good because what we ask people to do in a halfway house is not easy: get a job, pay your bills, get up, follow the rules, make phone calls. All of those kind of pay your child support, to be, you know, be drug and alcohol free. All of those things are not easy things for folks to do, especially since they all, all don't come there saying, I'm ready. You know, that's, that's not the case. But 75% of the women are, are, I think that's significant. And I think probably the most significant number where it's, I don't know if it's causal, we had this conversation yesterday with Mike and Bruce Stout, um, but it definitely is correlative that New Jersey's prison population has been dropping dramatically and where New Jersey really defies a national trend. Since 1999, when we hit sort of the peak of how many people were in prison in the state of New Jersey, we are down 22%. For women, we're down even, it's even more dramatic. We're down 32% from 1999. And I can't, th I, it, yes, there are other sentencing issues, there's other, other things that are impacting that, but it really is a combination of effort, I think, that makes those kinds of numbers real.